Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Jeff. That was like a marching band coming through here. That was like so much energy. Ooh, okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, start by uh, thanking the incredible people who are making all this happen for us. I'm sure that's been going on all during the conference, but just in case not, these incredible people in the back who welcomed me this morning so early to make it okay for me to talk, for all of the amazing work everybody's been doing, and Eric, who my fellow traveler, thank you. And to all of you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I thought maybe I would start with um, a little story it's partly because of this. Um, I was in Hawaii, uh, and there are several Hawaiians here who I got to work with, which was magnificent. But this particular moment, I was um, in an abandoned Coast Guard station. The, um, our Coast Guard had left it, and now the Hawaiian Kumahula of Raylene Jackson had taken it over. So now the Coast Guard station is a place for um, this beautiful Hawaiian dance to happen, and if uh, uh, Kumahula, uh, it's a, um, and when, they, when they work, it's the little tiny children all the way up to the very, very, very old people. It's a beautiful thing. And we were working on, um, the, well, I was working on the relationship between gesture, which is a big part of my postmodern life, and gesture, which is a big part of the cultural heritage of the people who dance there. We were having a blast. And then, like everybody's, like, stopped looking. Like everybody, they stayed present. I mean, their bodies were there, but. And finally, I, I did this. I turned around, and there was a school of whales going <laughs> behind me, much more interesting. <laughs> so what I wanted to say was to invite you to um, enjoy the scenery. Um, yes, you can listen to my words but you might decide to pay attention to my gestures. You might notice that um, something someone says, uh, maybe it's me or something Jeff already said or something Amy brought up, or maybe it was those two posters she put up, remind you of a childhood story. Or maybe you, um, maybe you really are upset about the politics and you just have to keep going back there. Or maybe you're remembering Bamudi yesterday. I'm curious how we listen. What, what happens to us? And when you come to a talk like this, which of, which of you is showing up to listen? I know sometimes it's just taking notes. It's like I know when I go, sometimes I become like the student in me. I take every word down. But lately, actually, for the last few years, I've been trying to figure out if it's possible to listen with my full artist self. So I've been working on something called listening palettes. I don't even know, it, I, I can't even figure out how to teach it, like we're experimenting right now, but the idea of a listening palette is that I actually have a piece of paper and usually some colored, colored pens or something. And I try to see if I can track all the different ways that I can get into what someone is talking about. For example, when I told you the story about the Coast Guard station, what pictures came into your imagination? What pictures came up? What, what was there? Can anybody tell us? What did you see in your mind? You saw palm trees? You saw a beach? Shades of blue? Shades of blue. Yeah, a concrete structure. And now the, what you're doing gesturally is this, when actually this Coast Guard station was more like a series of arcs. But these incredible pictures you have is our way of personalizing data. You are personalizing information every single second. And how often do we harvest it? And how do we do that? So I'm going to encourage you, if you'd like to experiment, try keeping track of the pictures. You will lose my words. Well, maybe you won't. I've been working on this for about five years. I can't do the words and the pictures at the same time I'm trying. But it's all right, I don't mind. You'll get some, I, I'll be very curious if you decide to try it. So what am I doing when I think about something call, I'm calling now a listening palette? Basically, I'm trying to give shape 
to something that's been a kind of a momentum or a kind of a, a way of experiencing that I couldn't quite, um, well, I couldn't even call it something. We're sort of in the midst of this with teaching artists. For how many years were artists teaching? Thousands? Probably. But it's like, it was like this. <laughs> And then we started to say, well, wait a minute, there's something happening. Maybe we'll put a little membrane around it. Maybe we'll call it something. We'll begin to give it shape. Those of you who, I got to see one session yesterday besides Bamudi, and that was the uh, online session. And you can see them trying to give shape to what this thing is. It's pretty interesting. Well, it turns out the scientists are busy trying to understand this too. So let me tell you this story. <clears throat> I got interested in doing work with scientists because I, I was, uh, someone had proposed to me a dilemma around genetics and what was happening with genetics and, and research. And I too had come to a point of view that science was moving so fast that we had no way as communities and cultures to deal with the information. And that if artists spent time with scientists and we actually made work in relationship with scientists, that maybe uh, our our concert halls, our community halls, our workshops could become a place where communities could come to grips with, well, Pluto's not a planet anymore, for example. That's not, <laughs> that's not so serious. But there are some really serious things coming about. I often think it's like living in the universe when you thought the world was flat and then they told you it was round. Like, it's major. It's major, and that's happening. So I got involved with scientists, and I, 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 it was quite interesting. And then I met some physicists, and they said, you know, we, we'd really like you to go uh, to CERN, which is where they're smashing the particles. I said, no, no, I was done with science. I'd done my project. I was finished. <laughs> and then they said this. They said, no, 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 we're going we're gonna to figure out how the world began. And I said, well, good for you. <laughs> 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 but <laughs> what about... What about the other origin stories? What about them? And to their credit, this particular group of physicists said, I know, we're a little bit concerned about that. The upshot was that I did get to go to CERN. I did get to see, we got in the tunnels. Actually, they hadn't pushed the button yet, so we got to do some dancing in the tunnels. We, I did end up making a piece called The Matter of Origins, but the story that particularly I want to tell you is this, that for most artists who start to get involved with, with scientists, and I'm sure some of you have already been doing this in your own work, you come across eventually the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. <laughs> and this is my version, not their version, and if there are scientists in the room, forgive me, or not, I don't know, I think this is actually a good version of it, but <clears throat> basically, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says this, you can measure the shape of something, but if you do that, you cannot get its velocity or its momentum. But if you measure the movement, the velocity, the momentum, whatever word you want to use in there, you will not see its shape. Isn't this interesting? So, thinking palettes, attempting to give shape to something that's been momentous. How do we listen? Who shows up when we're listening? Is it possible to, 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 stretch, to change the shape of that? so that you only don't listen in a linear framework with lines that go like this because that is the shape of our training and our education. Is it possible we can change the shape of that? Or our institutions. Most institutions get pretty concerned with shape. They do. They find the shape and it's, it's really important, like this institution, it was shaped at a certain time and place in history, and that was important. It drew a membrane around some ideas and said, wait a minute, we want to elevate these things. We want you to see this art. But look what has happened to our shapes. We hang on for dear life, and we can't figure out how to break back into the momentum because the momentum is the times we live in. And we live in urgent, momentous times. And our shapes are, they, they can't flow like that. <laughs> they don't serve us. So we have to figure out how to get back into the momentum. And 
oh, artists. Oh, this is what we do. I hope it's what we do. Is it not what we do? Rehearse, 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 rehearse. It's a mess. It's an, oh, give shape for a second. Ooh, not quite the right shape. Back to the, oh, here's a shape. Oh, oh, gee, look, I've put the show up now and it's still not the right shape. Right? And actually, not all art forms equally, not all genres of every art form, but still, the potential, like I, it, you know, in the movement world, it's almost all ephemeral. Giving ourselves shape for long enough is quite an amazing thing. So we have a certain way of letting go. But I think it's, it's really important to understand. That's why if you decide to play with your listening palettes, it's not just the outcome I'm curious about, it's how you did it. How did you form a shape and then figure out that you could let go. What agreements did you set with the people around you? By the way, we're about to let go of this shape, we're gonna do a different shape. I'm sorry, but all the tenured faculty will not like that new shape. <laughs> and that's the problem, because the shapes are interlocking. You want to be at a university where we have equitable, new, aesthetic, uh, uh, possibilities given the changes in what is being made and constructed and is so beautiful in our communities and you can't hire people because there's tenure. You won't be able to hire for 15 or 20 or 30 years. So the shapes are locked in, except they're not, because we have ways, I hope, to address it. So that is the first of three sort of um, I don't know what to call these things, kind of theories, kind of uh, theories that come out of artistic practice, I'm not sure, but that's one of them for me, is this idea about how do we move back and forth, how do we shape shift, how does that happen? <clears throat> and before I leave that, just like to address one other part of that, which is um, <clears throat> an idea that comes up a lot when we think about that kind of change. Because what I, I like to think, is that when I change my shape, I'm still essentially in the same atomic, molecular, cellular thing, right? I still have all the information. It's just the shape changed. But you know, when I move between, like sometimes I say when I'm in an institution that's giving me a lot of trouble, I'll just say, well, I'll just be like water. I'll change my shape, I'll be like water. I'll come around the other side of the problem. I'm really good at that and I'm guessing most of you are too. But I want to tell you that it takes energy to change shape. And when you move into water, it's you who's expending the energy. We're good at it. We have got to figure out how to also get the shapes with which we're working with to do the changing, not just us. <clears throat> which raises for me just briefly this thought about transformation, which comes up a lot because, I mean, a lot of, uh, <laughs> the way I've been thinking about this lately is people experience transformation as if it's like that. A aha moment. You know, a thing happens, you go, <gasps> and I guess, I know that's true, I mean, I've had them. But my experience is that transformation takes, oh, I don't know, five, 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years that to, to lay the groundwork, to put in place, to test those things that you think might work. Oops, I said this thing, you didn't quite get it, I'll come back tomorrow, let me try it again. Oh, now I think I have, oh, maybe, like that. I was um, 10 years at the Roosevelt Hotel for Senior Citizens, which is where I did a tremendous amount of reshaping my art form. I was five years as an artist in residence at Children's Hospital. I was 20 years in my synagogue. I was um, going on 15 years with the scientists. <clears throat> I'm lucky I'm old. I mean, I am, and you know, good, this is the real privilege of my life, good nutrition, two, two parents, solid middle-class education. I'm lucky. We don't all get that much time. But I do want to say that time matters and to understand that these kinds of transformational practices we're talking about do take time. 
although I will advocate that at my own university, I just wish we had a hammer. <clears throat> So I mentioned the Roosevelt Hotel, and I want to go into um, the second part of this. And for some of you who, know, who I've met over the years and know me, I, you already know this particular part of it, but I, I, I hope it's of use to those of you who may not. So essentially, um, I went into a senior center because of the death of my mother. I was in my 20s. I was bereft. I didn't know what to do. OK, I'll make a dance about what happened to me and my family. I need old people to welcome her. This was in 1975. This is pre, I like to say pre-jogging. I mean, nobody was even moving in public. Um, so, <laughs> the, you know, the idea that you could go into a senior center, which, by the way, the old people were all warehoused. I didn't even know old people. I had to go find them. It turns out there was a senior center two, two miles from my house in Washington, D.C., where I lived. I won't go into m all except to say that it was entirely a transformational experience for me over a period of 10 years. Um, but what happened during that time was something like this. People would come see me. They'd come once a week. The, 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 the class at the Roosevelt Hotel uh, would attract as many as 60 to 100 people who lived in the building, older people, and then also a lot of people would just come to see what was going on because word got out. It was one of the best dance classes in the city. <laughs> it was really fun to be there. But um, <clears throat> people would say stuff like this to me. Okay, Liz. That stuff that you're doing at the Kennedy Center, because by then I would formed a company. We were starting to tour. At that time, the company was all young people. Speaking of shape and momentum, it took me about five years to figure out how to integrate that because I was living with a really old mindset about who could be in a dance company. It didn't happen like that. It took time. But anyway, that time. So they'd say things to me like this. OK, the work you're doing at the Kennedy Center as we toured, that's up here. And the work you're doing at, that, at the Roosevelt, at the hospitals, that's down here. This, art. This, all right, maybe social work, maybe therapy, all kinds of words for it, not art. Or about two to three years in, I started to notice this. People would go like this. This is the good stuff, the stuff in the community, the stuff you're doing. That's amazing. Why are you still bothering to be in theaters? It's, it's old, it's white, it's European, it costs a lot, it's male, no, 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 no. They weren't wrong entirely, but... <laughs> okay, why would I want to choose? Why would anybody ask me to choose? What an impoverished way of thinking. Just poverty, like, because I was like learning like crazy. So I started to do this, which is really easy to do with my hands. <laughs> but I did also begin to live my life that way. I want to say we live in these worlds, hierarchy. We learn our, we're educated in hierarchies. We are expected to behave in hierarchies. But we are trying to do this. Everybody in this room, you are trying to do this. I know that. And in fact, you have all kinds of strategies and tactics and ways of thinking so that you can. And actually, this is all schematic, of course. Really, you, know, you can make it a circle, and then things are next door neighbor, like they were that day when I was in Hawaii, and we were looking at an amazing embedded cultural form of practice and a highly sophisticated postmodern form of practice. And we were putting that, and of course, they were interchangeable in that moment. Not without a lot of other practices put in place in order for that to happen. And that's what being on the horizontal is about. It's not necessarily the fact that I can say, let's put the two gestural forms together. It's all the work that precedes our capacity to bring those things together in a humane, ethical, just, fair exchange. There's a lot that goes on. So I think of this as hiking the horizontal, and I have a little book of essays about it, should you care to do more about it. I, again, I know every one of you knows, could, could come and tell us stories about what this is like. But I want to address just a couple things that are important to me as we think about this, and it relates to shape and momentum and how we're able to make those changes as well. Um, first of all, in this world, 
this is good and this is not good. Pure and simple. This is good, this is not. It leads to extraordinarily lazy ideas of, ex of excellence. The people up here do not have to ask themselves why this is excellent. On what terms is this excellent? And to whom and for what purpose? It's predetermined, that's the point. Once you do this, okay, now what? Well, we want excellence all the, across, all across. Well, what, how does that work? Context. Roberto Bedoya, some of you may know, he talks about the sovereignty of context. And by the way, the scientists are thinking about this too. They also are thinking a lot of, about context. I'm working with some people on something called productive ambiguity. And the way in which they get to productive ambiguity is through context, contextualize everything. So for example, Children's Hospital, where I got to be for five years at that time, wanting to be the best postmodern choreographer I could be, the rules were, can you make movement that no one's ever seen before? Can you put that on the stage with a lot of light, maybe hardly any clothes on, and you'll got it. <laughs> Interesting set of values. <laughs> but nonetheless, I am acutely aware of the standards. Acutely aware. Hospital, they don't want that. Turns out what they want is, can I keep the children moving for about 30 minutes? Can I make it possible for the families to view their child's body with love and hope as opposed to the disaster that they're afraid of? Is it possible that pain actually goes away for a little bit? Is it conceivable that actually the nurses and the doctors who might slip by see this child in a way they've never seen them and it changes the way they relate to them the next time they come into the room? Is all that possible? Yeah. But you can see what an amazing set of commissions that is for an artist. Right? It's, it's a whole other set of standards that I have to meet that are not the standards that I was uh, shaped for. So I love that. It's one of the things I keep saying is that for those of us who decide to spend time away from our studios, away from the aesthetics of whatever uh, in the hierarchy is top, we get to grow as artists. It's not just good for the children in the hospital. Pat, pat, pat. It's good for me. And it's really good for my art form. In this world, if I want to make a distinction, say between community-based practice and dance therapy, let's just say I'd like to make a distinction between those. In this world, I literally have to put something down in order to make that look than that. And even if you describe it differently, the feeling state that occurs is one of defensiveness. In this world, you can make distinctions without rancor. I cannot tell you how critically important this is, because we have to make distinctions. Dance therapy and community-based practice are not the same all the time. Remember context. The distinction can be life-saving if we don't make that distinction. But I don't want to lose weeks feeling bad because I'm not one or the other. I don't want to get my back up and get all defensive and all that, I don't. So what are the skills and ways of working we want to put in place so that we can, like I say, because making distinctions is this create, I mean, it's essential part of creativity. This is not that, um, depending on, which God you may believe or not believe in, or which God has been uh, dominant in the life of your communities. The uh, God in the Hebrew Bible is busy creating at the beginning, and that God creates by making distinctions. Day is not night. It's essential. But, and then we shy away from it because we don't want to get into that feeling state. It's not that we don't want to be critical. We need to be critical. It's like, how do we do that? I'm not going to get into this today, but I would say the critical response process helps a lot for those of you who may know that form. It's, um, uh, we're writing a new book about it that's going to get more into that, and if I have time, I'll get into it later. But I, I don't have time to address it now, but I will say 
that many of that was a, a, a tactic, a strategy for me to figure out how to get feedback now that I was operating in this world the way I was. And um, it's, it lives. It, and uh, you can go to my, the website, LizLerman.com, and you can, you can see it if you don't already have that. I'm just going to look at my watch and see how we're doing here. OK. <clears throat> There was something I want, oh yes, one other thing. Um, over the years, I began to observe or ask myself this question. Is there something, were there any standards that actually lived for me across the whole horizontal? Was it always contextual? And I began to examine myself and the work that was happening around me and I landed on three things that I think are true, maybe no matter what. Um, one is that people are 100% committed to what they're doing. Two, people know why they're doing what they're doing. And three, something's revealed. Now that last one's pretty subjective. Something's revealed, like to whom? I might feel that it's worth it to make a work or have a workshop or do something where the revelation is for the individual artist that's in the room, even on the stage. But then it's my responsibility to make sure that other people understand there's a revelation going on. This means I have to counter one of the major, major conventions of modern art, I might have to explain something. <laughs> How did it happen? <laughs> we get, I, I still get it, even when I get, <laughs> I recently got a very nice award and the New York Times called me didactic. Not because I don't know how to multiply all the places I can put my work, complexify, because they don't know how to. They only have one box. So on this question of revelation, here again, we are challenging ourselves to find the mechanisms, strategies, whatever, so that more and more people can participate in what it is that we love so much. We can still hide it, we can make it a game, we can turn it into a puzzle, we can do all kinds of cool things. There goes our, there, there, we're starting to stretch ourselves as an artist, we're starting to work at our systems, we're trying to change the shapes, we can do all that. But I think it's incumbent upon us, along with that instigation stuff, to think about it. Where and when and how are people getting the skills, the tools, the knowledge, the, 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 the way in, the clue, whatever that is, into what it is that we're doing. And this is really useful for all of our students as well. It feels to me an ultimate form of privilege to be able to say, I know what's happening and nobody else does. I got it, you don't. <clears throat> so that's the horizontal. <clears throat> the third thing that I wanted to begin to address, and this is perhaps in some ways where I'm, I'm I, I used to not be confused, but I'm getting quite confused about it. Um, and that is whatever we, um, whatever we think of as ethics or uh, systems to help us do better and even what doing better looks like or is. Um, one way I started to think about it was this. Okay, what were the artists doing, and what are the artists doing if the universe is defined as being on top of the back of a turtle? What are the artists doing if the universe is described as a clock? What are the artists doing in a community which defines God this way? God decides to create the world. Oh my goodness, there is no room because God is the world. So God contracts and makes space for the world. What are the artists doing if that's the idea? What are the artists doing, for example, in an era of genetic engineering? What are the artists doing? A lot of us may be saying, 
tut, tut, Monsanto. We really don't like what you're doing with those seeds. But meanwhile, let me take apart everything I know and put it back together in some weird way and see what I can make. <laughs> Is not postmodernism a bed for genetic engineering? We are complicit. I think. I'm trying to understand that. I want to understand what to do about that. I want to understand because I'm in the business right now. This is the main thing I'm working on is something called the Atlas of Creative Tools. I believe creativity is, you know, is the most amazing thing in the world. I think everybody can have it. I think we don't have to wait for it to come unbidden. I think we can create the conditions for it to happen. I think we know all kinds of things about it. But at the heart of creativity are things like this. Multiple ideas for the same thing. Remember, we want ambiguity. We want you to have different ideas. We don't want it to be singular. This is singular, this is multiple. But guess who's really good at that? Our president. <laughs> he is really good at multiple words for the, well, no. He has a singular word that he's over and over again. But I mean, you understand that he messes with the truth. He messes with the truth, well, so do we. All right, so does this mean we have to put something in place around the way we work with our tools? And is that part, when you say instigation out there, and you know, what, is that part of what we need to be looking at? I am so free and easy with these atlas of tools, I want everybody to have them. I get so excited when I see them confirmed somewhere. For example, the Harvard Law School commissioned me to do a piece about human rights law, which in, it was for the, 60th anniversary of the Nuremberg trials. And I originally t told them, no, I couldn't make the piece because I actually didn't think I could. But they, um, the woman, Martha Minow, who used to run the law school, she, she really encouraged me and she said, I'll help you with the research, which was fantastic. So she was in the room a lot. Um, we're currently working together again on something called the Witch of Forgiveness. So she, she's pretty amazing. But back to Nuremberg, turns out she had been involved with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I don't know, do we have people here from South Africa? Anybody? I, I, again, I'm going to paraphrase and I don't want to do injustice. It's complicated, it's not all perfect. But one thing they did in the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions is they came up with four definitions of truth. And this is how they made it through that time in their history. Uh, the facts, that's a kind of truth. Uh, the forensics, like what happened to the body. And genocide, this is really important. You gotta look at the bones. <clears throat> the third is something they called um, narrative truth. Each person telling their own story in their own way. This we know is a major subscription and idea in our work. And the fourth is something they called social truth. Social truth is the way a community figures things out over time, it doesn't happen fast. Social truth, I think for me was when for example, after Charleston, Nikki Haley got them to lower the Confederate flag. That felt to me like, wait, some kind of social conversation was happening. And for those of you not from the United States, the Confederate flag is the flag of the South during the Civil War, and it is flown regularly in some communities as a sign of Southern heritage and in some communities as a sign of uh, white supremacy and it was flying in the state capitol all these years, <laughs> came down. So, I think this is amazing. I find out about four, de four definitions of truth. I'm like, yes, this is, this is totally an affirmation of creativity. And yet, living with this president, I ask, what is our responsibility? What is the moral compass? So, um, I get to work with Bamudi. We, we spend time together uh, two times a year. We co-teach. Uh, we might be moving into a relationship where we might uh, help. He, he may help me with this new piece. I hope he will. Um, we're taking our time building our relationship. Remember, I spoke earlier about time. We're taking our time. <clears throat> but I brought to him this idea. Uh, I'd been working, uh, some of you who saw uh, Samantha Spees yesterday at 5, uh, dancing um, from 5 to 5.30. She's with Urban Bush Woman. I've also had the great pleasure to work with her. 
Um, and uh, uh, Jolly and I were working together on a piece called Blood, Muscle, Bones, The Anatomy of Poverty and Wealth. Uh, we were looking at the impact of poverty and wealth on the body. And anyway, we had found um, uh, up in rural Vermont, I know we have some Vermonters here, an amazing rural poverty program, and they had come up with this idea, along with others, they didn't come up with it alone, of seven kinds of wealth. I'm not gonna go into that part. The important part is that you, financial wealth is just one seventh. There's also uh, natural wealth, uh, your individual health, a lot there. But the point that they did when they work in communities is they would get stakeholders from all seven forms of wealth. And then you agree not to raise the wealth of one at the expense of another. That's the agreement. So for example, gentrification, you are raising built wealth. Yeah, you're gonna clean up that, you're gonna clean up that block. You're gonna make the buildings not be abandoned, that's a good thing, but not at the expense of the networks of the people who live there. So a values chain, which is what this is called, a values chain helps you try to keep that idea. <clears throat> Won't raise one at the expense of the other. So Babuli and I have been working on, we've simplified it. We've talked about, uh, we have like a circle which we sort of put in, in quadrants. And we have these four areas we're trying to think about. <clears throat> one is aesthetics. And he already told you yesterday this beautiful definition from Brian ba Brayboy who I work with. What a people think is good, beautiful, and true. Might I just remind you for a minute, in this world, these people have an aesthetic. I was a part of it. I can enter that world. What a people, downtown New York, lofts, that is a people. And they have an aesthetic of what is good, beautiful, and true. This is, it's okay. You just, it's the question of imposing it on the whole world that's the problem, not the fact that you have one. All right. So in our quadrant, Bamuni and I, Aesthetics is one quarter. Individual uh, accountability is a second quadrant. Um, social responsibility is a third. So it's not just us alone trying to figure out how we do this. It's what is the social uh, way. He often talks about it as our cultural radius. What, with whom are we working? Where do we belong? How does that work and how, is, how do we ac accommodate ourselves within that? And the fourth is institutions. And that's where we put our systems. It could be the, the, uh, you know, the school you work with or the nonprofit you work with. It could be this institution, Carnegie Hall. It could be the system. How, is, uh, how, how are dances made and toured around the world right now? So I'm gonna say those four things again. And the idea behind this is, this is where I, <laughs> A listening palette might help because it would be easier. <laughs> but the idea is you wouldn't raise the aesthetics at the expense of your social accountability. You don't get to fix the system or the institution and leave, uh, leave your social community behind. You, you, you don't get to do that in this framework. You have to figure out what is the relationship of these things to each other. Uh, so your individual accountability, your social responsibility, uh, your institution, and your aesthetics. I wish I could tell you I know how to do it. As I mentioned, I thought I did. But I just failed again a few weeks ago, really poorly. And I've been in investigating what was it that caused me to, d to behave in a way that, in retrospect, was... And I'm in the midst of making a new piece. This particular new piece, although it will engage communities, it will also tour, it's also going to go on stage. I'd like to think by now I have solved all the problems around doing that, but there's something about the way the system works that even I couldn't act morally responsibly. <laughs> it just makes me really sad. <laughs> So I'm not trying to speak, oh, I am speaking from on high, but I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't mean to suggest it. I think it's really, really, really hard to do. 
So I want to, um, I'm going to pause for a second. We have a few minutes for questions before I do a couple of last things. But when I go back to both shape and momentum and this idea of, of uh, the horizontal and pose the possibility of aesthetic equity, what are all the changes to each of our own individual shapes and to the systems and to the world that we have to make in order for that to be a possibility? And to, for those of us who may feel in order to do that, we lose something. We lose something. I want to say that this is where shape and momentum is just so powerful. Because remember I said you don't lose yourself. When you change from ice to steam to water, you're still you. You have your molecular, cellular self. You're not, you're not losing. Your shape will change. Your perspectives will change. The way you do your work will change. The way you walk into a room might change. The way you are appreciated might change. Yeah, that might change. But that, you know, your essential molecular self is there. So let's, I'm going to pause for a second. We have a few minutes. Um, if there's something on your mind you want to say or if you want to share what image has been coming into your, your heads, and then, uh, and then I'll finish up. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You're working with professional dancers. What was the easiest or hardest or sharing of getting the people to come along? Did you get the people to come along with you when you were trying to do create other pieces this way? Were yeah. you able to get those dancers, some yeah. of them, to come mm -hmm. along? And Absolutely. Not everybody. But it, let me just point out, this is like, a f it's fun to fall. It's really fun to fall if you think you're going to stop here. It is not fun to fall if you think you're going to do this. And most people feel, because most of the time what we do is either or, we just flip. And if you say, oh my God, I'm gonna be on the bottom now. You don't wanna be on the bottom. You know how you think about the bottom. You've spent your whole life thinking about that. And you do not want to go there. Which has a lot to do with the last election and why people, why status is such an important thing that we never talk about. But so for me, it's getting people to understand that there is this possibility or to fall down there and then climb yourself back out again. Sure, not everybody can. Most people are so relieved, so happy to be in that new world. And also there's a lot of new, new ways of being that are really exciting. Uh, yeah, back there. Um, could you tell us about um, your last experience where you failed? Oh, I, I, um, I don't want to go into too much detail just because it involves a person, but I'll just say that... Um, um, I was const I'm in constructing this new piece. Uh, it's called Wicked Bodies. It um, was inspired by an exhibit I saw, 500 Years of Drawings of Witches. Uh, I saw that in Scotland and then again in, in, uh, at the British Museum. And um, I began to think about the criminalization of knowledge, what happens to knowledge, and that every culture has its witches uh, across time. But uh, in this particular period of time as a, as a white woman, Jewish, which I feel very strongly about, but I also am white, then the question about whether I can bring together people from different uh, backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, to work together on this piece becomes an interesting dilemma. And what protocols do we put in place? Uh, I, um, some 30 years ago, I said I'm making this piece in collaboration with the dancers. I began to write right away, of trying to make programs the truth of what actually goes on in rehearsal hall. But that does, even that didn't do justice to what I was hoping to do. But in this particular context, I had already arranged and made uh, relationships with some artists in the room, and I was bringing some new artists in for us to see if we could make it work. And um, I realized that uh, all these different people in the room couldn't agree to the same set of, of conditions for the next step. But I was already too far into it with some. And so in conversing with the newer people, I realized that I I did something that I shouldn't have done. And, and I just, you know, the words come up transactional versus relational and all of that, and you could see me flipping back and forth between those. So um, I, it just it's where I'm going to end today when I come back to it. So maybe I'll just go into the last two things really quickly. Um, <clears throat> I'll just keep moving on that front. Uh, I don't know, some of you, uh, those of you from America may listen to Radio Lab. It's a, it's a curious show. I don't like the whole thing all the time. They're so zany. They're so, but 
But I do love it in the car because, you know, you get little bits, and that's all you need, <laughs> little fragments. So I was listening to Radio Lab recently in the car, and they said this. They said that um, the Earth used to spin faster. Oh, ooh, really fast. And then we got our moon. And when we got our moon, we slowed down, I think, about a second. So I've been wishing that I had a moon and wishing that all of you have a moon because I think if I had had a moon, I would not have done what I did. I was working too fast. Remember I said transformation takes time. So I wish for you a moon. And then the last thing is just, um, I had to do some writing this week and I was surprised at what I wrote. And I thought it might be relevant here. Um, well, actually, I made the print big enough. Um, it has to do with, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, teaching artists and our nomenclature. And how, uh, you know, if you do a flip like this, you make a horizontal and you say, okay, let's make this be all about teaching. Then we can look at all the different ways that people teach. It's not that there's this, you know, there's just so many ways for the word to exist in the world. I had a, a company member who said to me one day, you know, you never teach company class, and I never learn. And I said back to him, but I'm teaching all the time. Uh, it didn't work for him. He needed the shape. So I, uh, I was writing about teaching, and uh, a Washington Post critic wrote about me years ago, you know, you're an inveterate teacher. You can't help yourself. At the time, I was a little put off because I feared that he felt this was a bad thing. I've decided what he said is true and not a bad thing at all. Well, not if you think of teaching the way I do. It's not lecturing. It's not giving advice except when asked. There's a form of didacticism to it, but that takes work. Teaching is laying a trail, sometimes treacherous, sometimes gentle. Teaching is having sifted through enough repetitive experiences, painful losses, great highs of unexpected joy and pleasure that one can actually, quote, step back with acceptance. Not just make space for others, but actually carve and create a space for the unique discoveries that lie ahead for those now centered. Teaching is not just about the past. My teachings live in the way I am organizing what I know, listening palettes, <laughs> but also the way in which I am moving into unknown territory and by noticing who is coming with me and how I am navigating these new ideas and putting old ones to new purposes. So thank you, and thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you.